Was Herod really great? That's what we'll talk about today. Now, Herod was an active man and soon found proper materials for his active spirit to work upon. Flavius Josephus. Today, we're going to talk about Herod. And despite the fact that he has a short piece in the Bible, his influence is throughout the Bible. But not only that, he is a guy that outside of the Bible is known. We have historical events of him, and we know a lot about him compared to a lot of people at that time. When I was in Israel, I didn't realize it because I didn't do my research, but I had a chance to see many of Herod's buildings and they're still standing. I don't know. The road outside my house can't last more than three years, but Herod's building can last over 2,300 years. That's kind of cool. But Herod, he was a bad man, and we'll talk a little bit about that too. So the first thing to mention is a lot of our information about Herod comes from Josephus, and Josephus was a historian at the time. He wrote two books called Antiquities and Jewish War, and that's where he mentions some pieces of Herod. He supposedly was friends with a guy who was a secretary for Herod, worked in Herod's court, and so he got a lot of his information there. Because sourcing wasn't what it is now today, we don't know how much of it was from that individual who was on the inside and how much of it was from other sources. And the one thing he showed about Herod, I guess, is to say he was a complex guy. I was watching during the Christmas holiday all these movies of the nativity, any TV series, movies. And most of those shows put Herod in as some sort of crazed, diseased uh, maniac. But he wasn't that. He couldn't have been that. He had to have been very smart, very cruel, but also very political. And we'll talk about that interaction with the Bible and what his actions meant. He also built amazing buildings, as I mentioned, some of them still standing to some degree in Israel which is pretty impressive considering how hard it was to actually build things back then. We also get information about Herod from the Talmud and the Mishnah, which are ancient Jewish writings. And they were oral tradition for a long time, and eventually they were written down. It mentions that Herod kept Jewish dietary laws, that he did some other types of Jewish laws, and there was a lot of suspicion about him. So his father was Edomite and his mother was Arab. And the Edomite area was in southern Israel. We're not going to talk about much of it today, but if you recall all the way back in the Old Testament between the twin brothers of Jacob and Esau and how Jacob bricked his father Isaac into giving him the inheritance of his land, even though it was promised to him from God, because Esau was a hairy man, he pretended to be a hairy man and got his blessing and therefore his property. Esau's people became the Edomites. And then Jacob's people were, was Judah, the Jewish people. He's the father of Judaism. So that split is right there. And so the Edomite people essentially became Jewish through their time after the revolt against the Greeks. We'll talk about that in a minute. But Herod was raised Jewish. His father said he was Jewish. And we don't know exactly how much, but there were parts of Herod where he at least understood Judaism enough to get people to be on his side. So we'll talk a little bit about where his people came from. Think about the fact that Alexander the Great came through this area in the mid-330s BC, took over a huge amount of property, right? He kept pushing east until he could get to India, where eventually Alexander dies. But he does control this area of Israel And after Alexander died, the city of Alexandria was taken over by other people. They were heirs, obviously, to the throne, and they ruled this Judean area. The Greeks generally liked the Jewish people, thought that they were smart, they were scribes, and so they appreciated education. But when Alexander came through, he just put governors in place and said, hey, pay me taxes, give me a lot of books, and, you know, just don't overthrow my people. And then he'd move on further east. But as the years went by, eventually they started ruling with an iron fist and wanting to make the Jewish people, who they thought were a little bit backwards, who thought some of their practices, like circumcision, I mean, who's going to like that, were backwards. And so they started crushing more and more the religious freedom 
the financial freedom of the people in Israel. So despite the fact that when the last stage of the Greeks came in, they promised some tax relief, they promised to be nicer, give a little bit more freedom to the Jews that were living there. There is something that was called the Hellenization of the Jews. Think about the fact that the Jewish Bible was written into what was called the Septuagint, which was a 2,000-year-old Greek Bible. There was a lot of mixing of culture. There was a, what, they, what they called the Hellenization of Jewish people. And so we see at the time of Jesus, Gr- Jews speaking Greek. The Bible was practically entirely written in Greek, except some words in the book of Matthew. So Greek had a huge influence on them. But they pushed too hard. And a group of people with Judas Maccabee, you might have heard of them called the Maccabees, overthrew the Greeks that were living there, the rule that was living there, and took it back and brought Israel back into an independent state with the help of the Parthenians, which is the remnants of what I think was the Babylon Empire. This is where we get the story of Hanukkah. The Maccabees fight back. They light the eternal light in the temple, and it should last for one day, but it lasts for eight, which was all part of this Maccabee rebellion against the Greeks. So then, eventually, we have this Maccabees dynasty, which was called the Hasmonean dynasty. They hated the Greeks. It was an anti-Greek culture. But there were a lot of people who still really appreciated the Greeks. Then, eventually, we have Antipas, which is Herod's father, who was on the side of Julius Caesar. And he helped in the Judean area with the Romans, because the Romans start coming through and taking over this land. But there's still that Hasmonean dynasty that's in place. So Pompey was a general underneath Julius Caesar, and he took the Judean area over. And Antipas, Herod's father, and Herod himself helped Pompey crush the Hasmonean dynasty for the for good. And so they put him back in rule, but essentially at that point, the Hasmonean ruler was essentially a puppet of that family. And then they were eventually gone entirely. So Herod smartly marries the daughter of the Hasmonean dynasty person, had both their parents killed. But now he sort of blended that area. As Caesar was killed, then it was Mark Anthony and Cleopatra against Augustine. Julius Caesar names Augustine to be the heir. His name was also Octavian. And there was a war. Julius Caesar and Cleopatra lose the war. So now we have Augustus as the Caesar of Rome and Herod and his father make peace with him. So they're, you know, somehow they're able to shift from dynasty to dynasty to dynasty and not get killed off, which is pretty good. Herod probably had a really good education growing up because his family was wealthy and had inroads with the Romans. The interesting thing about the Romans is at this point, they had already sacked the Greek Empire. But someone said that essentially they swallowed Greece and became Greece. They were an uncivilized culture who, when they took in the Greek culture, became better. You had people like Marcus Aurelius, who was a Caesar. You had Nero. You had all these people who really appreciated the Greeks, married Greeks. And so it reminds me of the Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory when the girl eats the blueberry candy and she becomes a blueberry. Rome ate the Greek candy and became Greece, just a Greece with a better military. Invasion of Pompey was in 63 BC. That, again, ended the Maccabee, the Hasmonean independence. They captured Jerusalem. and They needed someone to take care of it. So initially, Antipas, which is Herod's father, took care of it. He was the governor at this particular point. This was in 47 BC. He was assassinated in 43 BC. His son, who was also involved in Roman politics and was a super smart guy, and who was also a governor, became in charge of the entire area. And after he'd done such a good job, was named King of Israel or King of the Jews. So what was interesting is the Romans, like I said, swallowed Greece and Greece overtook the culture of the Romans. But there were a lot of Hellenistic Jews living in Israel at this time. And again, Greek was the language that most people spoke. And again, most of the Bible was written in Greek. But there were a lot of people who were considered to be Hellenized to the point where they weren't really Jewish at all. 
And so sometimes these were called Gentiles. It's a little unclear that when we hear about the Greeks living in Israel, were they Greeks that were left over from the time that the Greeks overthrew the land of Israel? Were there Greeks who just came along with the Romans? Or were they Jewish people who appreciated the Greek culture so much they were just Greek? They were no longer Jewish. So then eventually Rome, like I said, sacks the entire nation of Israel, taking it back from the Parthenians. And so Herod, for his part, We don't hear a lot about him in the Bible. Talks about how he was asking the Magi, you know, I'd like to worship the Christ. You go find him and let me know where he's at. It was a trick. And he was paranoid about anyone who would try to tinker with his rule. But it probably wasn't crazy. It probably wasn't mad like all the television shows make him out. He didn't stay in power for all those years by being an idiot. So he wanted to make sure that There wasn't an upset in the country. The one thing that the Romans wanted, which was a very similar thing to what the Greeks wanted, is you can do you, you be you, Jewish people, but pay our taxes, do what we tell you to do, and don't have revolt. And then we'll all be happy together. The nice thing about Herod is he also had his own independent army, which helped put down any sort of eruptions that were going on, any people from the Hasmonean dynasty who were trying to take things back because Herod had a very tight relationship with the Romans. And a lot of traditional Jewish people who didn't like the Greeks now don't like the Romans. And so it's problematic because this is a guy who is basically letting our culture get completely taken over by the Romans. And there were a lot of people who thought it was great. The Greeks and then the Romans after them, educated, had strong civil works. They built roads. They built big buildings. I mean, they were kind of an impressive culture. And so some people were for it and some people were against it. And like I said, what we know of Herod is that he was Jewish. His father believes he was Jewish. And his family, even though it was Edomite, became a convert to Judaism sometime after the Maccabees pushed out the Greeks. But We don't know how much he believed in the Messiah and how much he just knew enough about what was supposed to happen to try to squash it. But you don't get to stay in power for this long by being soft. So he initiated the slaughter of the innocents, which meant that all the boys under two were killed in Bethlehem. There's a lot of controversy about why Josephus didn't write about this. But to be honest, Bethlehem's a small town. It probably had five. 15 boys of that age. It's a backwater area. He probably wouldn't have written about it because Herod killed lots of people. And this was not shocking because Herod was paranoid and he ruled with an iron fist. But he also did some other things to try to get the people on his side because you can't just crush people and hope they don't rebel against you, much like the Greeks found out with the Maccabees. It's like Princess Leia said, you know, the tighter you squeeze, the more solar systems, solar systems, squish out of your hand, right? You can't be all just tough about things. You have to appeal to people as well. And so our only real interaction in the Bible with Herod at that point is when Herod dies. Mary and Joseph are in Egypt at this point, And the angel said, okay, Herod's dead. It is safe for you to come back. And so they come back. Even though Jesus never meets Herod, his presence is there. We see Jesus at the temple that Herod renovated. We see buildings, soldiers, and infrastructure that Herod put into place. Even the temple court. This is the world, the stage that Herod built and Jesus played out in. So let's talk a little bit about some of the buildings that Herod built. So the buildings are really where Herod gets his reputation and why he would be remembered to this day outside of the Bible. The first most important thing is he renovated the temple. So he brought it back to stature with the temple where we'll see in Matthew that Satan takes Jesus up to the top of the temple. This is a huge structure with a giant courtyard. So it's impressive inside of Jerusalem. But he also built like an amphitheater inside of Caesarea. When I was there, there were concerts that were still in this place. And there's a harbor that goes around it. And you can see that this was once, and it still is, an amazing thing, especially when you didn't have the engineering. Supposedly, an earthquake 
destroyed this area quite a bit. And so a lot of the buildings and the items are crumbled. But I wish I knew more when I was actually in Israel, knowing that this was a structure Herod built. Then you'll find there's a place called Matzada, which is this giant mountainish thing with a plateau at the top. And so Herod wanted to build a number of palaces and he had them in various areas. We'll talk about the one in Jericho in a minute. Because if there's a rebellion in Jerusalem, you could go out to your castle out in Masada. If you wanted to, you could go, the weather was bad in Jerusalem, you could go over and spend time in Jericho. So you, he had castles and he built fortresses in various places. Masada is amazing. And so if you get a chance to Google images of it, it's really impressive. It has a rampart, which is a ramp, like kind of going up the outside of it. This is what the Romans built to try to break in after the Jewish workers revolted. They were not going to come down. They were not going to let the Romans come up. And so they basically hold themselves up inside of this. And there were baths. There were buildings in there. And eventually, because they ran out of food and resources, the Romans just basically said, fine, we'll just wait here at the bottom and you'll eventually starve to death. They ended up killing themselves and drawing lots to see who would be the last one to go. But this place is so honored, that is where all military people are sworn in. He also built um, his winter palace in Jericho, and that's along this hiking path that I took called the Wadi Kelt, where I think you walk from Jericho to Jerusalem. And it's just beautiful. It's a really amazing hiking area. But you can see what's left of his winter palace that also had beautiful tree and plant gardens that he, you know, cultivated. You can see the structure of it. And then the last place is his other palace that was called Grodium. And it was a fortress and it was sort of built into the side of the rock that's there. So it's really enforced. And they found his sarcophagus there. There's a lot of other buildings inside of Israel that were was built by Herod or towns that were reinforced and all of that. So why did Herod rebuild the temple? That was always kind of a big question. Was it because he had faith and he wanted to? Or was it because he was trying to appease a group of people? So the point where the Greeks got sacked by the Judas Maccabee and his group, they promised to rebuild the temple because this was such a hardship to see their temple crumble to before them. And so the Greeks promised to rebuild it. They never did. So Herod does it. Now, does he do it because he can't really give Jews freedom? He can't give them a lighter tax, but he could do this for them. And they would be so thankful that the temple was built again, they wouldn't think of going up against him. So when he re renovates the temple, then the temple structure is reestablished in Jerusalem, and he starts to replace the temple structure, the, the temple rulers with people he trusts, because you'll get a mixed bag. Some people who are like the Pharisees, who don't want to be beholden to the Romans, they're pagans, they don't follow God. Then you have other people like the Sadducees who were aristocrats, and they wanted to be Roman and Greek. They wanted the sophistication. And even though they were Jewish, they still accepted what these other nations were bringing in. It was modernization. It was science, you know, and construction. So they like that. And eventually what will happen is what happened with the Greeks. The Romans allowed a lot of flexibility for the Jews to worship as they wish. But around 70 AD, that flexibility went away. It started going away more and more. And then the Romans sacked, tore down Herod's temple and started building their own things. They put a temple to Jupiter, which is Zeus, because the Romans had the same gods as the Greeks. They just called them different things. And that was the end of the temple, period. So while you can say Herod was horrible, which he was, he had enough smarts in his politics in order to keep the Jewish people happy, to keep the Romans happy, and not to have rebellion. It was a very tense situation with all these different factions, like you had the Hasmonean dynasty, like you had the Essenes and the other dedicated Jewish cults, but groups of Jews who believed in the scripture. You had the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you had the Romans, you had the Greeks, you had people who were living from all nations in this area. This is a tinderbox of that. 
But you also had to realize, too, that is no matter how much Herod was Jewish and maybe believed in the Jewish things, you didn't get very far in Rome unless you also acknowledge that Octavian Augustus was God, maybe a God, but among many gods, and that does not go along with Judaism or Christianity. He had to have a little bit more flexibility in order to do that. Okay, so Herod had children. He had Herod Archelaus, who was the eldest son. So after Herod died, he became the ruler of Judea and Samaria. But Archelaus was a bad leader. He was also cruel, and he wasn't as good at managing people as his father was. So in 6 AD, Rome disposed Archelaus to France, banished him, essentially. Then there was Herod Antipas, which was the next son who was given the land of Galilee. And so Antipas ruled until 39 AD when Rome also dispatched him. And then there was Herod Philip II, who ruled the other territories north and east of Galilee. And he did a pretty good job because we don't know much about him, which means it was probably pretty quiet. There's Herod Philip or Herod the Tetrarch. And there's like some scandal with Herod Philip II, whose wife left him for Herod Antipas. And there was all sorts of play between the fact that one brother stole another's brother's wife and somehow this got mixed up into the John the Baptist story. She was very beautiful. She had a temper. And so this is how John the Baptist was arrested and eventually killed. So the end of Herod was pretty ugly. Some kind of a disease. He had something. It's really gross to mention what was, I think his bowels were falling out or something like that. It was really terrible. He was in a lot of pain all the time and it probably drove him insane. So they, some people try to say this is why he was so angry and scheming because his illness was making him awful as a human being. But this was considered to be somewhat of a curse against Herod. And so when Herod did die, it was in a very painful way. So that gives you a little bit of a rundown about who Herod the Great was. Like I said, not mentioned in the Bible very much. And so but Herod went all the way back to Julius Caesar, General Pompey eventually Mark Anthony and Cleopatra, and then we get to Augustus, who ruled the area. This is a cross-section of history, and we also see that throughout this entire time, these themes come up throughout the entire Bible. Jesus at the temple when he's 12, all his times that he went to the temple. We think that possibly Paul was a Hellenistic Jew. He knew a lot about the Greeks. You can tell that. He was studied in that. And all of the New Testament plays out in the land that Herod ruled, even if he wasn't alive at that point. This is his dynasty, his legacy. So my challenge to you is think about who you would be in this particular piece. Would you be one of the Roman supporting Jews that were living there? Maybe you appreciated their technology and their expansion as a civilization. Would you be like John the Baptist and living out in the wild? Would you be like Joseph and Mary who were living as exiles trying to get away from Herod? Or would you just be like the Pharisees and the other Jews that were living there, understanding that the Romans were squeezing you out of your own country, but there wasn't much you could do about it? What part would you play in this story? All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Part of this episode is a continuation of our discussion from the Bible in Small Steps, where we have Herod in Matthew 2. So we have more time in this podcast to really dig deep into a topic. If you're interested in a slow crawl through the Bible, three chapters a week, that gives you time to read it, to understand it, to soak it in. So again, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, it's called the Bible in Small Steps, and you can pick it up in your podcaster. Right now, I'm having website problems. As soon as that clears up, then I'm going to go ahead and submit to some of the other services like Spotify and iHeartRadio and Amazon. But we're going to have to wait just a little bit because of the website and the troubles I'm having right now. And taking back to small steps, remember, and our walk through history starts with small steps. Small steps.